Welcome back to Gunny Morning Quarterback. Today we're going to talk about big army tactics and maneuvers and why the Minuteman should know these things. But real quick, before we get into actual maneuvers and what each team member role is, um, we're going to go over two points of why this is important to the modern Minuteman. So let's get into it. Number one, the primary purpose of the militia is to defend the United States. It does this by being a deterrent to both foreign and domestic threats. And every once in a while, there is a military, whether foreign or domestic, that will test you. They will, they will call your bluff. But the most important part is that the modern Minuteman or militia, which is everybody, is prepared to follow through should they call the bluff on the deterrent effect. God forbid our armed forces get wiped out or mostly wiped out uh, when one or many of these proxy wars that our government has dug us into go awry. Who then is left to defend the homeland in the void? The National Guard is going to have its hands absolutely full with just trying to maintain order. They're not really going to be capable of mounting any kind of resistance. Also, you may not know this, but the National Guard can be activated and can be sent overseas to possibly replace the troops that were just lost. So just know that we could be emptied out very quickly and the whole weight of defending the country could fall on the American citizen. Not saying that's going to happen right now, but if you look throughout history, at one point, every superpower does eventually fall. And it sure looks like we're falling right now. So why not be ready? Now, in the event that they are here, uh, just like back in the Revolutionary War, when the Continental Army worked with the militia and coordinated together, that could be one possibility. The National Guard is essentially a organized militia that works under the government. They're federal, and then they work for the state, and so at any point they can, they can be recalled to the federal level to do whatever the Fed needs them to do. So. A lot of people don't realize this and think that the National Guard is the militia, but it's not. The whole purpose of a militia is a disconnect from the federal level. And so as a citizen militia or Minuteman may have to be activated essentially in these very bad times, there has to be a base knowledge, whether we're working in conjunction with or independently of a National Guard or whatever forces here to defend the homeland at that point, you have to know the basic function so that you can, but again, you have to be extremely careful with this because you don't want to fully emulate the military and become them because that takes away the whole strength of the Minuteman and the militia, which is just to pop up, do some guerrilla stuff, and then pop back into society and go on living our lives. We don't want to be in that conventional setting. Being in that conventional style of warfare where we emulate exactly what the military does or close to it is extremely dangerous and not smart at all for the modern Minuteman or militia because in that case, you would make Biden correct, you would make Swalwell correct. When they comment, you need an F-16, man, or we got nukes, bro, either one of those. If you fall into that conventional setup that emulated the military of big militaries around the world, but specifically the U.S., we would just be sitting ducks. Don't make those jackasses right. Would it be advantageous to have an understanding of how other large foreign militaries move or function? The terrorists of the late 1700s had to know how their enemy moved, the British, the Redcoats. How were they moving? How were they functioning? and coming up with a way to defeat that. To be a successful guerrilla campaign to defend our own homeland, you have to know a you have to know how your enemy functions and find out ways to exploit that function. Find out their rules of engagement, ex exploit that. The US learned huge lessons in Afghanistan and Iraq. The enemy would take advantage regularly of the rules of engagement and the way that the military actually operated. So you may be familiar with teams. The fire team, HQ team, lead team, trail team, special weapons team, no matter which team it is, it is the smallest element. It's the foundation that everything else builds on. And then after that, everything kind of multiplies by two. So we have our teams. We're gonna look at the teams on a whiteboard in a second for a better understanding and actually get a visual of how things work. 
But just kind of, I, I just want to go over this real quick. So we got our team. We'll say it's four guys. Just we'll call it four guys. Uh, two teams makes a squad. So then you got four and four plus probably a squad leader, but not necessarily. So once you get a squad, and then we double that squad again, two squads, we move up to a platoon. We double the platoon and we make a company. We double a company, we make a battalion. We double the battalion, we make a regiment. And so on and so on. All these groups, all of these big names, they all reduce down to teams in the very end, which of course is made up of individuals and we'll go over those individual roles. But just for a functional understanding, just understand that we go, you know, Team, team, all right, that's a squad. Squad, squad, all right, that's a platoon. Platoon, platoon, all right, that's a company. Company, company, and, and so on and so on. And so we build on those foundational elements. This organization isn't just made up just to be, there's a reason for it. And that reason is the natural way that the human brain functions. They found by doing studies and much trial and error that a, a leader or a supervisor is capable of being in charge of or supervising a set number of people. And so that is carried through in the military. That's why there is a team leader to lead the team. And then once you have two teams, you have a squadron leader to lead that squadron, which is those two teams, which are those two teams. That magical number maxes out. Generally what they used to teach was around seven. So you would have a maximum of seven people directly under a specific leader. And so once you start to get more than that, you have to consolidate because if you're directly supervising 20 people, that's not going to work. You're going to need a couple people to answer for that group of 20. Incident command is the most boring class ever that I took at the fire department. And it really boils down to how many guys can one guy directly supervise effectively. And so that's why we got to keep those numbers down to two to five is kind of optimum. Getting up past seven is no good. That's why it's broken down the way it is. And this is why the scaling of a combat force works so well. It just is infinite in how big or small a military force can be broken down into. Each team member reports to their team leader. He represents them. And then that team leader reports directly to the squad leader. That squad leader in turn reports to the platoon leader and so on and so on. Scalable. It's, it's just impossible to directly supervise a massive amount of people. So that's why it's broken up. And that's why it's very important to understand how important the team is and how important that chain of command is. If you really want to learn how the chain of command works, do something naughty or bad at the fire station and watch as the emails rainbow up, go away, hit the big brass in the office and then come back down and land back at your station and land on you. That is a way to directly learn your chain of command in case you did not know. At least that's how I learned. Teams are so versatile that they can work independently, sort of. Especially when we talk about Minuteman and Militia needs. You don't ever want to go anywhere alone. You always need a team and that's why it's important to build that team now, build that community now. And even if, even if it's just your guys that you work with or the guys in your neighborhood, build that team and work on that team. Because if you don't, you will die. If you have a team, you may possibly die, but your odds are much better. Even if you're not in the military or you don't work for a paramilitary organization like the fire department or police department, you can still learn lessons that have been very hard learned from the past. That is the way that militaries generally work. Now, if something happens and they change the way that they function, which is very possible with satellites and laser beams and all that kind of crazy stuff, uh, you will have to adapt. You can't just do that stuff. You, you can't just make a team against a satellite laser being shot at you from outer space. That's not going to work. We'll have to figure out a different way. And finally, for this intro video, what about the guys who can't Minuteman? If you're incapable of becoming a Minuteman or militia, that is understandable. Not everyone can. Most people should be able to. 
I mean, you'll be responsible for toting around 50 plus pounds of gear at some times, and not everyone can do that. But if it's possible, get to that point now. If things kick off and you're totally unprepared and you haven't done any training and you're out of shape, and let's say you're fat like me, which don't judge, fat boys will surprise you sometimes, it will be way too late. You'll be behind the curve if you wait that long. But for those that absolutely cannot be active in those ways, uh, there are support ways in 2024. Many people, I would say, can help just gather intelligence right where they're at. They're not necessarily setting up like recorders or anything like that, but they are observing and getting intelligence that can be fed to people who can achieve physical things. Others are financially solid and also very charitable, which is immensely helpful because a guerrilla force is actually very dependent on funding like any other force. It's just the way it is. Uh, not everyone buys all the things they'll need up front. In fact, none of us do. No matter how much we stock up or think we have, we don't have what we really need. Others donate their time in helping people develop their skill sets, even if they can't do. And yet others just are think tanks that come up with ways to damage and hurt and destroy the enemy so that the good guys don't get destroyed in the process. And still yet others are very helpful in Minecraft with some more technical help. There are certain things that contain components that are impossible or very expensive for the average citizen to come up with. Even things that can upgrade an AR's capability can be 3D printed by the dozen and disseminated to those who are the good guys who will put them to use. The point is, if you are willing to help, you will find a way. I want to make that very clear. Don't think that because you're out of the direct fight that you're all the way out of the fight in Minecraft, if those things were to happen, you're very much in the fight. You just contribute in a very different way. The only people who won't help are cowards and the enemy. That's it. And if that's you, 